what do i mean by that what i mean is the way you discover new physics and this has always been the case is that you push physical laws to their limits okay by pushing a law to its limit you will see whether the law continues to be valid or breaks down so that's essentially how you look for new physics now these are the limits we are familiar with so we live in this world of cars and basketballs and the, the if this is the world of galileo and newton and if you push these laws you can push take a limit where they start you apply these laws to the very small and as you know this is where quantum physics was born you can apply these laws to the very fast rockets and so on that's where relativity came into being you can apply it to the very massive and that's where general relativity comes into the picture and i i will uh, my research project story is more to do with this so again uh, i i wasn't sure how to structure this talk so what i've done is try to do some balance between the science and uh, the project uh, the procedure of getting into a research project so these are the three things you want to do you try and push physical laws to their limits you recognize this is one theme in physics uh, and i think it's true in chemistry and science in general that any new idea will usually unite older ideas and i'll explain that in a minute i'll, I'll give you a number of examples of this so that's something i try to keep in mind when doing a research project in physics um an equal this is another thing so in school i i used to see teachers always tell me to solve a problem in two different ways and i always wondered why and i think now i have a better understanding why which is that if you do an equivalent reformulation of an existing theory sometimes it teaches you something new and i'll give an example of that as well so these are the three uh, sort of tricks of the trade one keeps in mind when doing a physics uh, project so uh, i talked about this uniting uh, old ideas here are examples so if you go back a really long time you'll find that humans thought of water ice and vapor as separate we know that's not true excuse me sir one minute yeah. one minute yeah uh, sir you are in first slide only or you are going you are moving the slides oh i have moved slides a lot uh, but uh, so slides are not moving sir oh i see uh thank you for telling me that uh, what slide are you seeing right now sorry the search for new physics sir first slide only okay this uh, can i try stopping and re yes, resharing yes sir sure sure okay is this visible now yes sir yes sir it's visible uh, is it showing a planet now yes sir it is showing a planet okay so uh, my apologies let me go through the slides back to where i was i won't give the talk again so this is the picture of the sun reaching out 93 million miles affecting the earth this is the letter of newton to uh, bentley is this also visible yes sir it is visible yeah, thank you so this is what i said about that one body may act upon another without the mediation of anything else uh, uh, so let me just spend a moment on this because this slide Was, is uh, i'm going to repeatedly work through this slide so you start at the big picture question which i have already explained then comes context which i had started to talk about then medium picture and then the small picture question so uh, here is uh, the first slide uh, basic summary was that we want to push physics laws to their limits that's where you get new uh, physics these are the limits this was the drawing that i thought i was referring to when it was on screen so as things get very small quantum physics as things get very fast relativistic physics and as things get very heavy general relativity so i i was saying that these are the three labels i will put through my talk to just show you where these ideas come in and i'm uh, can you uh, sorry can i just ask is the unification slide visible now yes sir okay i think the presentation is working again so let me continue so uh, uh, in the early days you thought of these three as different they're not uh, till uh, rather recently we didn't realize the sun and the stars were the same then with relativity and quantum mechanics we learned that particles and waves are uh, sort of the same electricity and magnetism are two sides of the same coin and with special relativity space and time get united so the the theme i want to draw your attention to is what science does and if you look at old chemistry with say mendeleev the periodic table 
uh, what does it say? It says all this diversity comes from a few building blocks. So again, uh, unity. You, you try to find common concepts and that is sort of the basis of uh, science, progress in science. So uh, why am I saying this? This is not philosophy. It's to say that if you have a new idea, it's likely to unite uh, existing ideas unless you're discovering something brand new. So that that's a different category. So let me let me give an example. So I had uh, this slide saying that uh, teachers ask us to do problems in different ways. And so an equivalent reformulation. Let me draw an example for that. So you you remember the standard story of Newton, which says that if you're given initial position and speed, the path is determined. So Newton said there is a correct path for motion. If I throw a ball, projectile motion. But then there was Lagrange who said, uh, actually, even if you throw a ball, all paths are possible. The correct path is the path for which of least action. Now, why is this? So we know that Newtonian mechanics and Lagrangian mechanics are equivalent. Both are classical mechanics, but Lagrange's mechanics, which is a reformulation of Newton mechanics, is advantageous when you try to talk about quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics takes Lagrange's idea and says all the paths are possible, but the probability of a path is proportional to this exponential factor. And then if you work this out, you find the correct path again comes in classical mechanics. In quantum mechanics, all the paths become possible. So again, this idea of reformulating a physics, any theory in a different way is likely to tell you something new. Uh, there is another thing to remember. This is only this is unique to physics. I think that there is a philosophical angle to this, which is that uh, remember the quantum mechanics story which is that if you, uh, so here's a, a horrible cartoon I have made, a uh, person looking at a dinosaur. And uh, if by looking at a dinosaur, you don't, you don't have any effect on this dinosaur because it's a large object. But if I were to replace that and look at a small object like an atom, then let me replay this. What happens is when I look at the atom, then there is some exchange of photons uh, between the telescope and the, or the microscope and the atom, and that itself pushes the atom. And this is the uncertainty principle that when you look at something, you move it. You're, you're using energy to observe something and that energy can move the object. And so that is where classical mechanics breaks down and you have a, a, a quantum mechanics thing. And there, is, there are all these sayings, uh, uh, what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning by Heisenberg. And they, it's also interesting that you find similar lines in say articles by Swami Chinmayananda where it said, man the experiencer is the subject that gains experiences of the world outside through his instruments of experience. So again, all of this refers to the fact that you are using something to observe the natural world. Okay, so uh, I think that felt slightly off topic for a faculty development program. So let me get back to the, the main theme, uh, which is we want to arrive at a question in theoretical physics. The big picture question I talked about, I've talked about context. Let me talk a little bit about the medium picture question. Um, so uh, let me give the electricity example. I think that's the best way for me to give this analogy. Uh, I, I, I let me call this level zero. At, at zeroth level, I want to study the electric force. And what I know is that the electric force is given by Coulomb's law that the force is proportional to the product of charges inversely proportional to square root distance. Now there are two problems with this law. The first problem is obvious that when R equal to zero, the force is infinity because one by zero is infinity. So at R equal to zero, it's infinite, which means that essentially you're saying if you bring charges together, then you can produce infinite force and then everything around us should be exploding and all the time. And now this doesn't happen. So we, we understand that there is a problem with the law. The other problem with the law is what I already talked about action at a distance, which is suppose I have two electrons and you're telling me they repel. How does this electron know that there is an electron here? How does this electron see that electron? So there is some communication. Maybe the electron is using a mobile phone, but somehow this electron is seeing this electron. Only then it can repel it. So these are the two issues with Coulomb's law. 
this is a level zero at level zero problem. Why is this of interest to me? Because I can draw the same two problems in gravity. So this is another thing in research. If you are looking at one particular kind of issue like gravitational physics, then try and look at parallels in say electromagnetism because these are both forces of nature. You will find parallels and here are the parallels. Gravity again is proportional to m1 m2 by r squared and you see the same two problems action at a distance. How does so here I ask this question. Here's my picture. The question here is how does the uh, how does the earth see the apple and call it down? The earth is saying fall down. That's why the apple falls. How how does the earth communicate with the apple? That's the action at a distance problem. And as I said at r equal to zero, the force is infinite. So this is the level zero problem. Uh, let me quickly just pause and ask. Uh, are there any questions and uh, are my slides visible? Was the tree visible? Yes, sir. Yes, your sir. Tree yes, sir. is also visible and your slides are also moving. Okay. I think you. questions we will take up at the end. So we have muted everyone. So okay. we will enable the mic. So Understood. once the presentation gets over, sir, at the end we will have a question and answer session. Understood. So let me share again. Level one. Yes, sir. OK, thank you. So uh, we've talked about the level zero, the problem at level zero. Let's go to the next level. So in 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 terms of the the actual date, I think this would come around the late 1800s, early 1900s, what I'm talking about now. So at level one, our understanding of the electric force improved a little bit because we introduced the idea of the electric field was introduced. Uh, and this lasted say 100 years, but then there is this question which a student can ask, which is uh, what is the field made of? Can I touch the electric field? And the answer is no, you can't touch the electric field. You can, for example, with a magnet, you can put uh, uh, iron filings and you can see that they follow lines. But if you actually ask me to touch a field line, you cannot. And so in the 1930s and later we have our modern understanding of the electric force, which I'll call level two. So level one is the idea of uh, humans invented some idea like fields, field lines to explain this action at a distance. At level two, this is our current understanding. Our current understanding is that two electrons come in and they repel each other because a mediator particle is exchanged. So two electrons come in, a mediator is exchanged. The effect of the mediator is to produce repulsion. And so we say, OK, the electrons repel. So this is our modern picture. By the way, the subject is called particle physics because two particles come in, one particle is exchanged causing repulsion. So the entire so everything is about particles. The subject is called particle physics. Let me go to gravity. So I remind you with gravity, we had this level zero problem. I explained this. Let's look at the level one answer, level one formulation for gravity. That is here. Uh, I'll just quickly mention at the time of Newton, space and time were thought of like this. There was a big clock for the whole universe, one clock. And then uh, everything happened on this space, X, Y, Z space. So what Einstein came and taught us was that the speed of light is universal, time and space are not. And as you take a limit, as things go faster and faster, the relativity of Galileo is replaced by Einstein's theory of relativity. So that's a limit. Also unification, serious unification that space and time are not so different that you can actually have just like you have X and Y axis and you do rotations between X and Y axis. You can also rotate between space and time. That was a brand new idea and so was born the concept of space time which united space and time concept. Now here is the level one explanation of the gravitational force given by Einstein in his general theory of relativity. So Einstein told us two things. Number one, matter curves space time. So if you put the Earth on, you assume. So Einstein said assume that there is a curved sheet or a curved rubber sheet. And if you put the Earth on it, it bends. Then if you put the moon somewhere here, suppose I put the moon somewhere here, it will roll down because the sheet is bent. And that is uh, that is the effect of gravity that we see. So matter curves space time. And then space time tells other matter how to move because of the curves. So this is general theory of relativity in uh, in two lines. Uh, 
What is the problem with the general theory of relativity? Uh, the first problem is why does matter curve space time? So if I give if I assume this rubber sheet and I put a heavy object on it, why does the rubber sheet go down? It goes down because of gravity, but we are trying to explain gravity. So this is uh, a bit of a uh, endless cycle, right? We're using gravity to explain gravity. The second thing Einstein never told us is what is the sheet made of? I said rubber sheet. We all know space time is not made of rubber. What is the sheet made of? We don't know the answer to that. So at level one, these are the two questions we don't understand. Why does matter curve space time and what is space time made of? Now, let me not give you the wrong picture because the general theory of relativity works beautifully. So if you assume this equation, you assume matter curve space time then you can calculate how things move very nicely. So this, uh, what is the gravity? So let me go back to electricity. So electricity after the field lines, we had this nice level two picture, which is our current understanding. What is our understanding at this level of gravity? In other words, how do we answer these two unresolved questions in general relativity? The answer is we don't. We don't have an answer to this. So this is the medium picture research question. What is the picture like the electric force that explains how the gravitational force works? And I don't have an answer to that, but that is my medium picture research question. So if we go back to my chart of how do you how you arrive at a research question in theoretical physics, I identified the big picture, gave the context, looked at the medium picture, and now we have to move to finding the small picture question because even now uh, I don't have anything to actually calculate or measure. So uh, here are a few tricks of the trade for small picture question. Again, I, I think these are things that all of you will be familiar with. So I'm, I'm sorry if I'm repeating things that are obvious, but I, I, I think it's useful to state some of these things. So one thing is it's always useful, no matter whether you're doing an advanced research project, a basic research project, whether you're a student or a faculty, it's always used to review textbooks on the subject. So for example, in physics, in electrodynamics, uh, there's a very uh, widely read book by an author called Griffiths. There's another more difficult book by an author called Jackson. So you find that sometimes it's worth looking through these. If you have not worked through these textbooks, it's good to work through them. If you have worked through them, it's useful to review what, what you learned there, particularly the portions that are relevant to your research topic. After you're done with the textbook, the next step would be to read old research papers on the problem. So what in physics in my area, we call these classic papers, right? So for example, the famous physicist Dirac has a paper on, on forms of dynamics. So this is almost required reading for all. So any student who wants to work with me, uh, after they do all the coursework, I tell them, please go read Dirac's paper and come. And uh, then we discuss it. Uh, the other thing we do in my area is we we search archive.org and Google Scholar. I, I don't use Google Scholar, but I'm told it's very good. Uh, I, I search archive.org regularly for papers related to your problem. So uh, one, one point, one, one standard story is you have to read a lot of research papers on your topic. And I personally find many research papers very difficult to read. And so what I do is I, I search a lot till I find a few papers that I find easy to read and then I read those papers. So I think that for each person you want to. So I would say collect all relevant references that you find understandable. And then I think an important part is to discuss with group members. Now a group member may be for a faculty, a group member could be a colleague, uh, head of a department, uh, a student, a postdoc, any of these things. Uh, I, I very often found one of the nice things about being in I, ICER is we have a large undergraduate population who is very, very enthusiastic. So I find sometimes that they are also fun to discuss some of these papers with. So this is sort of the uh, uh, sort of algorithm for how to collect material for the small picture question. Now I have a couple of more slides on the small picture and then I'm done with the physics part of my talk. Uh, so here is the current picture as of today. Uh, the electro electric and magnetic forces are actually united into something called the electromagnetic force. There are also two other forces, the weak nuclear and strong nuclear force. All of these, they work through a theory called Yang-Mills theory. And that mediator particle I told you for all these forces is a spin one particle. 
Now, gravity is described by the Einstein uh, Hilbert theory of general relativity at le that level one explanation. The level two explanation, how is it actually mediated, uh, is unknown. I, I, I cannot answer that question. So I, I'll come back to this later, but in research, I, one of the things we, we tell PhD students is, please learn to use the words I don't know frequently. It's, it's very useful in many, many contexts. Uh, so any anywhere in the world for any problem, usually I don't know is a very good answer. Uh, so uh, I said this already, the electric force is mediated by a photon. Uh, the thing I wanted to mention was that every force is transmitted by a particle. This is also a kind of unification because earlier if you asked Newton, he would say a particle and a force are very different. But now we know that a force is mediated by a particle. So I, I'll just mention a couple of lines and then I'm done with the physics portion. As I said, uh, uh, there is a reformulation. I told you it's always useful to try and formulate a theory in a different way. So around 2005 to 2010, there was a reformulation of Yang-Mills theory in a new approach called the MHV theory. And why this was interesting was because once you did the reformulation, then gravity, which we, are, as I said, we are not able to understand that well, suddenly uh, started looking very much like the theory we do understand, which is Yang-Mills theory. So actually gravity looks like the square of Yang-Mills theory. Now, the, the technical details are not important. What the message I want to communicate is that you, you took a theory called Yang-Mills theory, which is well known, well understood, and then you reformulate it, and suddenly it has some connection to gravity. So this reformulating an old idea is a valuable one. Uh, there's another uh, unification that I work on, which is to see if you can combine force with matter. We think of force and matter as separate. So that's another kind of unification. So all of this is essentially what I do, what brings me to the small picture question. And so some something like this would be what I actually work on and publish. So if you if you if you go back to this uh, slide, uh, the very big picture question of how does gravity actually work is still a far away goal and, and it should be that way. And then you have the medium picture question of um, uh, about gravity, uh, about what is the level two picture. And then the small picture question is something you can actually calculate. So uh, I think that's all I had on the physics part of it. Uh, I have this. A uh, nice picture that asks if gravity is actually just a theory. And then I add a couple of uh, more remarks on research. So I'll show you, uh, I think, exactly three slides and then I'll stop. Uh, so my first slide is all of these are random remarks, so I couldn't come up with a nice title for the slide. Um, uh, science concepts are difficult to master, and I think it's worth finding good resources and more importantly, multiple resources. So uh, we, we always encourage both for myself and students that you try and learn a particular topic or subfield or a research area from two, three different sources, because if you learn it from one, you will also pick up the prejudices of the author. If you learn it from two or three, you get different viewpoints. I think books are now a bit boring because they, they will tell you have to read what they tell you. The internet is nice because you can look up what you want to learn. So I think uh, using YouTube, Google, uh, in Google, by the way, if you put site colon edu at the end of any search, you can search uh, educational institute websites. And there I think you find a lot of material that's well written. Uh, in uh, This is very, uh, you, this is perhaps unique to theoretical physics that one of the things we tell uh, uh, beginning researchers, uh, junior faculty or uh, postdoc, we always tell them about this first principle sand on the beach idea. The idea is if you are dropped on a desert island and uh, you're all alone on an island, there's a big beach with a lot of sand, then obviously the, the first thing you want to do is to derive equations on the sand. So whatever you can derive on the sand of that beach is what you really know. And everything else is information. So in research, it's very useful if you can derive everything that you need in your research problem from scratch. That is, if you understand all the assumptions and so on. I said this already. I think this has been a very valuable friend for me, which is I, I, I use the phrase I don't know a lot because I don't know. And uh, it's useful because it's important to know everything that you, it's important to know what you don't know. Then you can be more confident in what you do know. 
and I think this 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 is an important thing. I think uh, in academics, particularly, there is a there is a feeling that oh, uh, a faculty should know everything, and that's not true. Uh, or a senior person should know everything. Or uh, how can you not know this? Uh, I think this is the this is a, a dangerous thing. I think it's better to just say I don't know and move on. There's a there's an old story that somebody was asked what is an apple, and instead of saying I don't know, they shouted orange, uh, which means that the person shows that they don't know what is an apple and they don't know what is an orange. So it's better to shout I don't know. That, that's the message here. Okay. Next slide. Uh, in I, I think it's worth taking the time to search for interesting research problems, uh, particularly because I think uh, all of us faculty, we've all done uh, say a PhD or we are doing we're, when we are doing a PhD, uh, beginning research students, you know that there's a paper that you have been shown or a research project that you are a part of. So you can keep continuing that. You can do a little more. You can you can make a small change and write another paper. That's fine. But I think it's also important separately to look for a, a different, more interesting problem. Uh, also, I think it's good to work on less explored topics. And so, uh, for example, if you if you are if you are part of a project, there are 15 people. There's a, a professor and uh, 15 other uh, say students. For a student, you don't you. It's fine as a student, but you you don't want to always be the 16th person in a research project. So sometimes it's better to avoid being part of a big crowd for one particular reason, which is if there is already a crowd doing this, then what value addition are you going to provide? Are you really providing a value addition is the question. I already mentioned this. Uh, do not aim to master everything. It's not doesn't work. Uh, I, I, I think there are probably a few people in the world who know everything. Uh, I have not met these people and I am not one of them. But I think in general it's OK to not know uh, too much, but I think this is important. I think one should aim to become an expert in one tiny subfield with awareness of other fields. So I think one issue is you it should not be. So if for example there is a big person in, in say Europe, let's say in Europe somebody is doing big research and you take their paper and you try to do a follow up research on it. Then remember that the world authority on that paper is always going to be the person in Europe, not you. And this is fine. This is how science works. It's incremental. But from time to time, you have to, I think, make the attempt to find a problem that is your own. And if you manage to solve it or make progress, then you are the world expert on that. I think that should be a goal for everybody. Uh, two other things I want to say. This is uh, more aimed at the students, I think. Uh, one is that there are too many factors to predict success. And uh, secondly, I don't know how to define success. So uh, this is itself a, a strange line. But one of the things uh, we tell students from uh, experience is you will find a student who is so bright, so sharp, who answers every question within 30 seconds and can derive everything. And then 10 years later, you don't know where the student is. Uh, student has flunked out of something. And then you'll find another student who seems very slow and doesn't understand and doesn't speak in class. And then 10 years later, you find the student is doing very well. Uh, I, I think my message is that one should not try and identify who is smart and who is not smart because I don't think we know and I don't think we have ways of identifying this. Uh, the other point here is that someone who is terrible at mathematics may do badly at theoretical physics, but may be a brilliant experimentalist or may actually have talents in say chemistry or biology. And when you put the person in those subjects, they do brilliantly. So again, it just doesn't make sense to think about uh, who is smart enough and who is not. So uh, the factors for success, I think, include things like uh, how how focused are you? Are you able to if you have 10 setbacks, you're de you're denied a promotion, you're denied publications. Are you able to still keep going? I think that is more likely to be a successful person than someone who gets everything very easily and never has to struggle for anything. But again, I, I'm making rather general statements which are probably uh, I, I should it. I'm, I'm hoping it's clear that these are general statements that they're, they're not applicable everywhere. 
Uh, and this another thing a students tell me is, oh, I'm not smart enough or I'm not bright enough. And I want to tell uh, any students listening that there is no such thing. I, I don't think there's such a thing. I think everybody is capable within a given range and you're very, very good at some things because you have uh, intuition or an ability there and you're bad at other things. And this is true for everybody. So I think uh, this picture I always find very useful to show, which is one of the reasons they put blinkers on a horse is to say stop looking at other people and stop comparing yourself with other people. Yes, the person next to you may have 25 research papers more than you. It doesn't matter if it's going to if looking at that is going to make you write 25 good research papers, then look. But if it's going to only make you feel bad, then why look you're wasting time. You might as well just do your work. So that's all I had to say. Uh, stay safe and good luck and thank you for listening.